So together with my uh, with the uh, German senior expert uh, Thomas Lutzkendorf, we will give some insights into the um, work we perform in Annex 72, which is on assessing life cycle related environmental impacts caused by buildings. Greenhouse gas emissions in the world uh, are by a significant share uh, emitted by buildings. As we learned in, in, 19, uh, in 2018 in the Global Status Report, uh, nearly 40% of the energy related, related carbon dioxide emissions were uh, caused by buildings, either um, by residential buildings, direct emissions by burning fossil fuels and um, like natural gas and oil, or uh, by residential buildings uh, by consuming electricity and the uh, CO2 emissions uh, emitted by uh, the power plants. Uh, similar shares we have by non-residential buildings and in addition to that, uh, the construction materials industry, they um, emit another uh, considerable share of these 39% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. If you look at the mitigation potential of the different sectors, and we see here uh, gigatons of CO2 equivalents per year from zero to seven, and uh, remind that uh, global greenhouse gas emissions amount to nearly 50 gigatons uh, per year. We see the energy supply, transport systems, buildings, industry, agriculture, and we see that the buildings, uh, they uh, exhibit the largest potential um, in greenhouse gas emission reductions with costs of less than 100 US dollar per ton of CO2 equivalents. By, by now we know that um, all sectors need to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions to uh, net zero to comply with the 1.5 degrees Celsius scenario, but still uh, the easiest or the low cost solutions are mostly uh, related to buildings. If we look at the building as an object of assessment and the level to act, we can distinguish several levels, like uh, look at the institutional or regional or national building stock. We can look at regional de developments, urban developments, neighborhoods or districts, or we can look at individual, individual buildings, which was or which is uh, the, the object of investigation in uh, Annex 72. If we, uh, structure the activities in the construction and real estate sectors into um, whether it's it's about new constructions or reconstruction we see here uh, that we have either to look into building new buildings extend the building stock um, replace existing buildings by new ones in reconstruction and refurbishing uh, the uh, the existing building stock if suited for uh, for a low carbon society and what are the relevant actors in, in this area? We do have the building permit authorities and legislator, which, which set uh, the, the frame on uh, and, and give targets regarding greenhouse gas emissions of buildings. We do have the building owners and investors, the financiers, design professionals and consultants, construction material industry, as well as construction companies, which, are, uh, which all are affected by uh, new laws or which all need to strive towards uh, net zero emissions in, in buildings and construction in, the, uh, in this uh, area of uh, living. We did uh, contribute to a, a meta-analysis of the operational and embodied emissions and assessing those uh, over time, uh, how buildings um, emit uh, CO2 equivalents, how, how they emit greenhouse gases, in the operation phase in blue uh, and in the um, in the construction phase in red, um, according if the buildings are built according to ex existing standards, according to new standards and according to new advanced standards. We did that for office buildings as well as for residential buildings. And if we look at the residential buildings, we can see that um, the embodied greenhouse gas emissions, they increase uh, with the level of uh, requirements in the in the building standards, so they increase both in absolute size but also in the relative size and and tend to reach uh, 
nearly 50% of the life cycle related uh, greenhouse gas emissions of buildings. On the other hand, we see a further ten tendency uh, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions during the operational phase, which is on one hand uh, due to um, higher energy efficiency in the buildings, and secondly, in a reduced carbon intensity of the energies that are being used to cover the operational energy demand. If we look at the buildings in the context of sustainability assessment, and we do see here the three pillars, environmental, social, and economic sustainability, we see that uh, regarding um, greenhouse gas emissions, we will expect requirements from clients brief, but more and more also requirements from uh, legislation, from national legislation, uh, which are uh, put in force uh, to reduce the carbon footprint uh, of buildings, uh, which leads to uh, environmental, social, uh, uh, or in that case, environmental requirements for the works to be performed, um, which are then used uh, to technical requirements for the construction uh, work. So in the near future, we will expect uh, in several countries a budget of greenhouse gas emissions in the life cycle of a building, which will become part of a client's brief and also uh, legal requirements expressed as part of the overall environmental requirements. In Annex 72 and in the assessment uh, of, of a building, the environmental assessment of a building, uh, we deal with questions like, how can buildings and their life cycle be modeled? How can the life cycle ass assessment method, which is a method that is standardized in the ISO uh, world, how can this method be applied in a practical manner in a daily uh, business of um, construction of buildings or refurbishment of buildings? How can the required data on construction products and processes be determined and made available in databases, preferably in a as transparent way as possible? How can LCA and the LCA data be integrated into the design and which tools are suitable to support architects and designers in, um, in using uh, the LCA data, the envi environmental impacts uh, of buildings data uh, to reduce the, the footprint of buildings? Another question is how uh, about benchmarks and design targets, uh, which targets um, result in relation to the limitation of primary energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions in the life cycle of buildings? What are the planetary boundaries of the different environmental impacts and how can they be broken down uh, to individual buildings to know uh, how big a footprint of a building is allowed to be? And which terms need to be defined and which system boundaries need to be considered? These are typical questions that we are dealing with in the IEA uh, EBC Annex 72, which is on assessing life cycle related environmental impacts caused by buildings, which deals with mainly uh, two aspects. On one hand, we uh, quantify uh, the environmental impacts of the op operational energy and uh, water use, where we need to define what types of energy or which uh, types of energies do we need to include in the uh, assessment? Is it just the regulated uh, energies or is it also the energy of the occupants of, of a certain building? And secondly, uh, we cover the embodied impacts, which start from the cradle, the extraction of the resources to producing uh, construction materials, construction products, the construction phase on the building plot, then uh, during the use stage, maintenance, repair, and replacement, and finally, the end of life of the building, the dismantling uh, and recycling of the building materials. All in all, is performed in view of striving for net zero greenhouse gas emission buildings in the future. The Annex 72 is subdivided in five subtasks. Uh, the first one is on context specific uh, methodology guidelines. The second one is on workflows and tools. Um, one particular focus was on building information modeling, BIM um, um, tools, which are uh, more and more incorporating lifecycle assessment information into uh, these uh, tools. Third subtask is about case studies that uh, are uh, providing information on built 
um, cases, building cases, where uh, the methodology agreed in subtask one um, and the workflows used in subtask two are uh, illustrated. A fourth subtask is on LSCA databases, which is one of the um, important foundations of, of a life cycle assessment uh, and footprinting of buildings. Uh, how can life cycle assessment databases be developed, especially in countries which are yet uh, lacking these uh, data? And the subtask five is on dissemination. Um, this event is one of uh, those. With this, I'd like to pass uh, the word to uh, Thomas Lutzkendorf, with, who will show some insights into, into uh, the net zero and benchmarking of buildings. Thank you, Rolf, and i like to continue from here. My name is Thomas from Germany. I am the coordinator of Subtask 1 in Annex 72, and one of our main tasks is to create rules and recommendations in relation to assessment methods, LCA data, design and assessment tools, and benchmarks and target values. This has to create a system. This means, yes, we have mentioned already the four main targets, the four main objects of assessment and the four main objects for rules and recommendations, and this will create a package. This means it will form a system. If you change one, you have to adapt all the others. But because I'm uh, the subtask leader of subtask one dealing with methods and benchmarks highlighted here in this slide, I will concentrate my remarks on these two areas. So next, please. So inside our main part to create a report dealing with methods to assess the greenhouse gas emissions in the life cycle of building, we have to first discuss the possibilities to model a building and its life cycle. We come out with rules for calculation, assessment, and compensation also sometimes called offsetting of greenhouse gas emissions. We have to deal with uncertainties and the range of input parameters. We will discuss building integrated and site-related generation of renewable energy. We have to deal with imported and exported energy and related rules. And we will in take into account the effects of decarbonization of grid and production processes. So here are our final uh, target is to create rules and recommendations for a next generation of assessment methods. At the end of this year, we will provide you all with the final reports. Next, please. So let us start with terms and definitions. There are so many, let us say, carbon buildings around the world, but we start now to look for zero or net zero carbon buildings. But left-hand side, you can see the list of existing terms and definitions is long. You can also say too long. And there is a problem, uh, there is a deficit, not just in good terms, but also in definitions and system boundaries. So we like to invite you to use in future the term net zero greenhouse gas emission to make very clear what is the main indicator, what we can assess and what can be influenced during design and decision-making process. So from our point of view, net zero greenhouse gas emission building, this is one option. Next slide, please. We have to integrate this into the design and decision-making process to calculate, to assess, but also to influence the greenhouse gas emissions during the design process already. So. In a perfect world, we would start with target setting in client's brief already. We have to deal with in early design stage. There's a very important design step to create the building permit, and we will have, uh, let us say, uh, documentation and communication as built during handover. And during the use stage of a building, we can monitor also the greenhouse gas emission but in this case, just coming from the operational part. You see, there is a process. We have to start with more generic or average data, and later on we will take into account more the product-specific data, especially for all kinds of construction products. But in early design stage, we have also to deal with a certain level of uncertainty and must take this into account if we try to develop better methods. 
next click. Here you can see again uh, the, the different steps in the design process. But to make this very clear, for sure our object is of assessment is a building and its life cycle. But to do so, we will use a model for the building and the model for the life cycle. Right hand side, you can see the well known modules of a life cycle impact assessment. But here we have highlighted two additional modules, so called module B62 and B63. B62 takes into account the non regulated energy demand in Germany, for instance, for the elevators, and B63 takes into account the unregulated user-related energy demand, like uh, energy demand by the user. But there is one module more. Next click, please. The so-called D2. You know, D1 was already the recycling potential if we try to assess the embodied part, but there is also now a D2 for the operational part to uh, describe the potentially avoided emissions elsewhere through exported energy. I will come back to this later. So this is D1 and D2, D2 additional information in the life cycle impact assessment results. But again, this module, we will not take into account the full life cycle, but the reference study period. This makes a difference. Reference study period will last 50 years and by convention, the processes of end of life will take part after 50 years already. Next slide, please. Dear colleagues, and let me say, dear friends, this is a uh, time and place to say thank you, because here in Annex 72, we will deal also with operational energy demand and in relation to this operational greenhouse gas emissions. So we will use all your results your colleagues, your experts from energy related aspects. There is a long list of other annexes. And therefore, it's very important to tell you thank you. This is very useful and we will take this into account because this is our basis to calculate energy demand and operational greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. Let me switch on now to the benchmarks. Here we have to create a system of performance levels. And we like to highlight a new way to create a benchmark or a target value. In the past, it was in the old Bauhaus thinking less is more, starting on bottom up with uh, technical and economic feasibility. But now we will start top down to think about net zero or zero based on planetary boundaries. This will change the creation of benchmarks. We are looking and therefore we try to offer to you rules and recommendations. We are looking for legal binding benchmarks and target values supported by some guiding values for the design process. And it's important to think about reference units for benchmarks. You know there is efficiency, you can use square meter, but there are also sufficiency, you can use uh, the number of users or inhabitants. And for sure to uh, provide you with the current state of art, we are collecting examples and case studies to show what is already there. At the very end, we like to create a report dealing with rules and recommendations for the creation and the interpretation of benchmarks and target values. Let us dive in a little bit deeper. So we start with a question, what is meant by zero? Talk, we are talking about net zero operational greenhouse gas emissions or net zero greenhouse gas emissions in the full life cycle. We are talking about zero carbon, zero global warming potential or zero greenhouse gas emissions. So our favorite is greenhouse gas emission. I mentioned this already. But as you can see, what kind, what color of zero? There is a red, a black, and a green one. What does it mean, a red zero? From our perspective, this means a building with low energy performance left-hand side and square kilometers of PV system right-hand side to produce renewable energy to supply this bad building. And the green zero? A green zero means we are able to combine 
greenhouse gas emission neutral buildings with other, let us say, advantages for a good environmental performance. Next slide, please. And for sure, there is a very tricky topic, how to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions. It's all about the offset, rules for offsetting. There are several possibilities to reach a net zero emission approach. You can see the net balance with taking into account potentially avoided emissions or to allocate this left-hand side to take into account avoided emissions. There is a small risk for double counting. And as you know, this is a larger problem in life cycle impact assessment. If you have a double counting, this is a greater mistake. There are other options like technical reduction or technical removal. But at the very end of the day, we like to ask for the absolute zero, absolute zero emissions. But if you look to the small part mentioned there, we will not just have to include scope one, but including supply chain emissions. And this makes it more complicated. And as you can see here, you have to deal with all such small details. That's why our report will become more or less long. Next slide, please. Yes, and we have to discuss in a certain way the granularity of uh, benchmarks and target values. Left-hand side, you can see there are different performance levels. In future, we will hope these are also legal binding requirements like limit value or reference value. And for sure, we will see short and long-term target values. As a short term, we can discuss now nearly zero or introduced by International Energy Agency, a zero carbon ready approach. But in the long run, and this means perhaps uh, 10, 12 years from now, we have to achieve a net zero already. Right-hand side, you can see it's not just about the nearly or net or absolute zero. It's all about the system boundary. What is included? Just the building related greenhouse gas emissions, the operational part, the regulated part, or in addition, or the unregulated part or the user related part, just the upfront, the so called initial embodied greenhouse gas emissions or also including the greenhouse gas emission from replacement and deconstruction. So the approach D, the very last column, this is to cover the full life cycle. So if you see in future benchmark, you should always ask the question, what is included and what is the right performance level? Next. And uh, for sure, there are different aspects for a certain granularity. You can have a full aggregation allowing you, let us say, to use also for the economic optimum, or you can have a splitted approach with disaggregated uh, guiding values or also legal binding site requirements. You see here type three, just one figure or type two and type one with subdivisions into guiding values or site requirements. Right hand side, you can see a good example already in place from Switzerland, where the combo of architects and uh, engineers created such a table here with uh, target values. You see the requirements for construction and operation in the very last line and the guiding values for construction and operations. This is a perfect example how this may look like around the world in future. But next slide, please. As a case of application here in Germany, I'm happy to provide you with such an example here. We have used already inside Germany the results of Annex 72 to have a next generation funding program, also taking into account already binding requirements for life cycle related greenhouse gas emissions. You can see this here, but please do not compare the target values from Switzerland and from Germany. In Germany, we have included in addition module B63. This means we are including uh, as a user related energy demand. And therefore we in the tradition of passive house and efficiency plus buildings. Next slide, please. 
So at the very end, houses may look like in future. You know, there are performance classes in energy performance certificates, and we will adapt this to also explain here the greenhouse gas emissions in the full life cycle of the building. The final result is here the red box. The red box is representing the full life cycle related greenhouse gas emission. But not just to measure and to communicate, but also to influence greenhouse gas emissions, we should be able to show partial values like from left to right, so upfront greenhouse gas emissions as part of uh, embodied greenhouse gas emissions, the use stage and the end of life related embodied greenhouse gas emissions to have here the embodied greenhouse gas emissions in the full life cycle and four and five, the regulated operational greenhouse gas emission and the others like the unregulated and the user related. And you can see we are also able here to include additional information in relation to module D1, D2, and the offset type. In future, it becomes very important to, let us say, communicate your way to offset greenhouse gas emissions to achieve a net zero. Next slide, please. A short summary. You know, there are sustainable development goals in our application cases here, SDG number 13, apl ap applicable to the number 11 sustainable cities and communities. But climate action is not enough. Climate action now, this is the headline in our days. So, therefore, to make it real, we are more than last minute here to achieve the 1.5 degree target. We must have high ambition to achieve net zero emission, but more or less immediately. And if you look around, you will see there is a growing demand for life cycle based greenhouse gas emission results, especially here in Europe. Levels, the sustainability reporting system of European Commission, the taxonomy for financing real estate basic work requirements, construction product regulation, and the draft for energy performance building directive is asking to bring the life cycle related greenhouse gas emissions into an energy performance certificate starting in 2027, but without any kind of benchmark or target values. This is too late. From our point of view, in the coming debate with European Commission in relation to energy performance building directive, our message is very clear. Guidelines, data, tools, experience is ready for application in many countries. We have so many kind colleagues in all of our neighbor countries here in Europe. So it's possible to start from now. Do not wait until 2027 or 2030 to think about a small figure in an energy performance certificate. Start with legal binding requirements now or at least in 2025. And here I hand back to Earth. Yeah, thank you, Thomas, for, for this uh, excellent insight. Um, just to, to uh, build on, on the last info or last statement of Thomas, it's not only Thomas's view uh, that we need to start uh, or that we need to have legally binding uh, target values uh, with a roadmap to net zero, but we have the, the Monte Verita Declaration on a built environment within planetary boundaries, which was signed by more than 40 uh, scientists working in Annex 72 in the building sector from 25 countries uh, all over the world, from the Americas, from Asia, and from, uh, from, from Europe. And one of the recommendations to, um, to policymakers is to introduce legally binding maximum target values for greenhouse gas emissions. And it's about life cycle based greenhouse gas emissions of new constructions and of refurbishments by 2025. So in three, three years from now, with a roadmap to net zero, by 2035. This will uh, be a significant contribution uh, or, or allow the buildings to be a significant contributor to reach the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, targets that uh, most countries of the world agreed on. I'd like to close. Uh, more information on uh, the work of Annex 72 will 
um, be available in a few months from now on the Annex 72 website that is highlighted uh, on the on bottom right part. Um, so please stay tuned um, when we will be being publishing the uh, the final results. We will also have a, a special session at the Sustainable Built Environment Conference in September in Berlin, uh, which is uh, co-organized by our German, uh, Austrian and uh, Swiss uh, colleagues. It's not just the work of Thomas and myself, but it's the work of, uh, as Thomas said, uh, a large group of nice friends and colleagues uh, all over the world, uh, which contributed uh, to the findings of the Annex 72 in the last uh, three years and in this year uh, to come. With this, we'd like to close this presentation. Thank you very much for your um, kind attention and um, we are happy to answer questions. Thank you.